Uh, my name is Kevin Townsend, and I'm an applications engineer with NXP Semiconductors. And I'll be presenting uh, MWIN Graphics Library, which is a graphics library that we've recently licensed that you can freely use with any current uh, NXP MCU with or without an LCD controller, but uh, it's, it's, it's intended to be used with uh, uh, our ARM7, Cortex-M3, and Cortex-M4 chips that, that have uh, hardware LCD controllers in them. So I'll, uh, I'll just be start running through this. Um, so some of the current challenges that uh, I think we, we, we have in the marketplace today when it comes to user interfaces. I think uh, the first thing that uh, if you're interested in UI development, you're probably already perfectly aware of is that user expectations are constantly on the rise. People expect uh, more modern, more attractive uh, user interfaces and just on the product design uh, level, I think people are getting more and more demanding at the same time that, that, that product life, cy life cycles, resources available for development and time available for development are going down. Uh, but you're, you're starting to see uh, sort of TFT LCDs in, in products where they traditionally weren't present in things like white goods or uh, I've seen several ovens and washing machines now with, with full color interactive uh, touch screens in them that these aren't necessarily uh, things that existed a few years ago but there's more and more pressure uh, just to, to remain competitive to integrate this kind of functionality even into um, lower margin and, and lower cost products. So this is a, a definite challenge um, that uh, hasn't been, hasn't existed I think uh, until the last couple of years. And obviously, obviously one of the key difficulties with this is that UI development is very time consuming on, again, on any platform, on, on, on a PC. Uh, uh, there's, there's, this is something that can take a lot of time and a lot of resources, but particularly so in embedded systems where if you're not running with a sort of embedded Linux or something like that, this can be a very time consuming and, and resource intensive process simply because the tools aren't there for it. If you want to develop something for the PC, you have a very rich variety of tools to choose from that you can very quickly simulate your user interface and pass that around so that it can be evaluated by marketing or testing or, or by potential customers. On the embedded side, there are very few tools out there to help you in the UI development process. Basically, you're just sitting there, you're writing your, your you might get some mock-ups from, from marketing or from a uh, product design team, but to implement that into something that people can see, it's just a lot of sitting down with a lot of C code, and you compile it, and you flash the chip, and you run it, and if it doesn't work, because something is off by one pixel, you go back and you change the code again, and you recompile it, and you reflash the chip, and it's a very time-consuming process, even for, for the most mundane things, uh, like just drawing some basic shapes. When you have to add in, additional functionality like uh, a touch screen and, and, and uh, sort of the rich user experiences that people are just expecting even on, on, on sort of lower end products today. It, it, it can be a massive time sink. Uh, another difficulty is that simply because some of these demands are relatively new, there aren't a lot of embedded developers out there who have real hands-on UI experience. So the learning curve can be fairly steep. So uh, I think a, a fourth difficulty that, that needs to be addressed is that sadly engineers aren't necessarily the people you want designing your UI. I, I don't think NXP wants me sitting down and designing their UIs. Just uh, I think you, you need a certain mix of skills and you need a certain mix of people to, to, to come up with a, um, an attractive, effective UI that, that works naturally. And sometimes that communication between these different domains can be very difficult because uh, myself, uh, as an applications engineer, I'm, I'm used to sitting down and writing code. But uh, someone, if I have to work from someone from marketing, it can be very difficult sometimes to find the means to, to, to speak a common language that uh, um, they can sit down, let's say a graphics designer can sit down and, and make some, some mock-ups that are useful to me as an applications engineer, 
to, to find those sort of tools that can effectively uh, help with that collaboration process. There, there, aren't, uh, there aren't a lot of tools out there that can, that can facilitate that, sort of to provide a simulation environment. Uh, when I make uh, some, some UI uh, designs on my uh, in C, to how, how can I get that to a customer on the other side of the country or to someone else in, in a different branch office on the other side of the country without physically shipping them some hardware? It's a, I think there are, there are some challenges there with, uh, with the, just the communication between the, the different stakeholders uh, when you're working on UI design, but you need to have these people intimately involved in the process if you, if you want something that's going to be a success. So this, this is really purely talking about the, the software development side of things. But basically, you have a product, you know that you need uh, a rich user interface for it. it. If it comes back to you that you have to do the software development for that, you really only have two, two options. Either you're, you're gonna do it yourself, sitting down from scratch, maybe taking some little chunks of code here and there, writing your own library, your own low-level primitive routines for lines, circles, pixels, etc., bringing that up several layers so that you can make some little widgets like buttons, encapsulating the touch events and, and, and some callback routines. That's incredibly painful. I, I've, I've done that and, and it, it hurts. <laughs> I, I've spent months and months uh, in, in a former life uh, writing this kind of UI code, and, and it's tough. It, it, it's, it's a huge uh, drain on time. That, this can be good, uh, this can be a realistic approach if, if your demands are fairly simple. You just want to render some simple buttons or display some text, or maybe just render, load some bitmaps uh, from an SD card or something like that, then this is feasible. But you're never going to arrive at the level of, of user experience that people are expecting today. The reality is today everybody has an iPhone in their pocket and this is the, the very difficult standard that they're, they're going to judge your products by even if there's only a $3 MCU in there and the product is selling for, for $39. They, they have a, a set of expectations that are incredibly difficult to, to meet on a limited budget and with limited time. So do-it-yourself can work for very simple things but you very quickly Hit a, hit a bar uh, when, when you try to deal with things like anti-aliased text or sort of effective user uh, feedback uh, and, and just customizing that UI so that it matches your brand and, and the, the objectives you're after. So the other option obviously is a third party solution, whether commercial or there's some open source uh, graphics libraries out there. There's a huge number of libraries out there, just sort of pure rendering or some, some widget frameworks. Unfortunately, very, very few of those are tailored for the embedded space or for, for working with very resource-constrained embedded devices where we're talking about maybe tens or hundreds of, of, of kilobytes of, of memory and, and this needs to fit into 512 kilobytes of, of flash. Uh, many of these libraries don't take into account the, these types of constraints. You have things uh, for some very good uh, high quality rendering libraries in the open source domain like Cairo for, for uh, embedded Linux. But if you, if you need to integrate these into a deeply embedded uh, system, there aren't that many options out there. Uh, again, there, even NXP, we have some, some solutions to address very simple demands like uh, Swim is a, is a very simple uh, uh, sort of graphics design library that we provide that, that gives you the basic primitives you expect and to do some basic windowing. But on the higher end, uh, there's, there's very little out there, even in third-party solutions. Um, and this is, this is where I think this is a problem that at, at NXP I think we've, we've known about for a little while. And the solution that we've come up with is um, after sort of looking at, at all of the third-party options out there, I think by far and away, the, the most robust, full-featured and, and mature UI development solution out there for deep, deeply embedded systems is uh, Sager's MWIN, which is uh, it's developed by a German company. Uh, you, you, if, if you do a lot of development with, with ARM, you may know them uh, because of the J-Link. Uh, it's, uh, I think, a very popular hardware debugger used across uh, most major IDEs. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very robust, uh, industry-leading solution for UI development. Uh, 
There are some, a few other sort of competing uh, packages out there, but if you, if you look at the features, uh, this, this, this is far and away uh, ahead of many of the other options you'll find out there. And it's, it's the only one that includes a, a number of features like anti-aliasing, alpha blending, comp, uh, complex left to right rendering for text, Unicode support. Uh, I, again, these weren't necessarily issues five years ago, but th these are the kind of things that people expect today. So let's uh, just give a quick overview of, of some of the features and then I'll, I'll, I'll jump into these uh, sort of one by one. Inside the library, you, you have a, a, obviously a wide array of just the basic drawing primitives that you're going to expect and that you find in, in every library. These are things like lines, circles, triangles, maybe some simple polygons. The, that stuff is easy to tackle yourself or to, uh, you, you find it in every solution. I think where, where M1 starts to stand out a bit is when you look at, it has a very full suite of interactive widgets um, like combo boxes, uh, sort of the, the drop down box, uh, you click on the arrow and you get a full list of, of items, uh, text boxes, radio buttons, graphs. It includes advanced windowing support uh, so that you can, you can have layered windows uh, in, in modal uh, windows so that if one pops up, uh, all of the other windows below will be disabled until I close that window on the top. Again, these are features that have existed for, for 15 years uh, on the PC, but these, these are very time consuming things uh, to implement yourself. My personal favorites are alpha blending and anti-aliasing support. We'll, we'll get into that a bit later. That these are things that take a lot of time to do well. And the, the calculations are a little bit complex uh, to just to, to, to do that effectively. But you have an additional constraint in deeply embedded systems that you don't have uh, in, in 800 megahertz processors sitting around to do all kinds of floating point math. So not only do you need to do this well in terms of the quality, but the algorithms used for that need to be very efficient. And that takes a lot of, of work and effort to fine tune uh, just to, to arrive at the kind of uh, results that, that, that you need in, in deeply embedded systems. There are also quite importantly, and would include some standalone UI development and simulation tools. This is where earlier I had mentioned the communication issues. Having PC-based UI design and simulation tools can be a huge benefit just to make it easier to communicate back and forth between the, the different st stakeholders in the company that you can give a standalone Windows UI tool to somebody in marketing or someone in doing graphics design. With this tool, they can do some basic uh, UI design, dragging and dropping components on the screen. It saves, it, it'll save the mockups as C code that you can give back to a developer as something that they understand and that they can easily integrate into the firmware. So there, there are a number of tools like this included in the suite just to try to bridge the, the, these, these two worlds between uh, design and, and actual firmware development. Uh, the library supports a variety of image formats. We can get into that a bit later. And very rich uh, text support. Uh, there's a wide variety of, uh, of fonts already included in it that you don't have to worry about the license terms for. Also Unicode support uh, if you have to deal with an international audience. So just getting into uh, some of these in detail. As I mentioned, M1 includes all of the basic drawing primitives you would expect, like line circles, squares, triangles. You can vary the width of the lines and fill them, etc. cetera. Uh, more importantly, and something that's missing in a lot of packages that are out there, you can, you can do much more complex primitives, like arcs, multi-point polycons. You can add rounded corners. You can do not just fills, but gradient fills with a variety of, uh, of different patterns and directions. Uh, you can set multiple colors in there. Again, it's, these are the little details that, that, that really matter if you, if you want to make attractive buttons with uh, the, the, the kind of visual appeal that, that people have come to expect. Uh, aside from building upon those primitives inside the tool, there's a, there's a large variety of uh, probably 40 or 50 widgets, uh, they call them. Uh, a lot of things you would just expect, like buttons, check boxes, text boxes, drop down lists, progress bars, different types of windows, a huge variety of, of, of those, those common items, but also some that are much more 
time consuming like uh, this, this graph component over here. Again, things that uh, you, you can spend months of development time trying to, 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 to write this and integrate this yourself. And the advantage is that not only are these rendered for you easily with one line of code, but they fully encapsulate user interactivity like the, the touch screen events so that if you, all you have to do is drag this button onto your, your form and there, it will automatically go back to a, a callback fun function when you press the button or when you expand the drop down list or when you select a specific item saving you from, from having to, to worry about all of that plumbing underneath. Uh, again, this, if you look at the buttons on the top, it's very sort of <coughs> Windows 95-esque. That's sort of the model that, that Sager developing this library started with. Obviously, that probably isn't going to match a lot of what you probably want to do in your, in your user interface. Uh, in, in sort of this day and age, you want something that works well and matches your own design expectations. So many, not, not quite all of them yet, but most of these widgets are also fully skinnable or customizable so that you, you can keep all of that sort of plumbing underneath for the touch screen uh, uh, interactivity and the callbacks. Uh, but you can also fully cater those to your own design requirements. So you can see the sort of, this is the default canned uh, progress bar and you can very easily change that uh, to, to match the the, the design requirements that you have for your product. Similarly for, for uh, the framed window control here, that this is the sort of Windows 95 or even Windows 3.1 <laughs> uh, old fashioned window and, and you can, you just to show you, can, you can customize some of the appearance uh, for that. So again, this, this is more getting into some of, the, some of the features that really separate, I think, MWIN as a solution compared to many of, uh, of the other options uh, that are out there. Things like alpha blending, that this, 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 this can take uh, weeks of, of development effort uh, to do yourself. Um, you can see with a handful of lines of code on the top, you can very easily blend layers uh, between each other in an efficient way, even on a, on, on a, on a slower processor or something that's not uh, running in the, in the gigahertz range. You can see an example, if you, if you don't know what alpha blending is, um, you can see an example on these images in the bottom here that if you start with this image, you can apply an, an alpha mask to this image where basically the, the, the black pixels are opaque and the white pixels are fully transparent and then everything between 0 and 255 will, will be a different, uh, sort of a specific shade of, uh, of, of, of transparent. So, and you can, you can see the results here. You can blend as many layers as you want. Uh, you, can, you can have, as in the example here, that these are actually several layers. Um, and and this, uh, this sort of takes a good chunk of, of development effort off your hands and allows you to, 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 to give users some of the, uh, the effects that I think they're, they're, they're expecting today. I think uh, another huge one from my perspective I've written a lot, of, a lot of code myself or a lot of UI libraries over the years myself. And this one is a, is a huge challenge to, to try to do yourself efficiently uh, using anti-aliased text or lines. Um, how, I, I imagine most of you are perhaps familiar with anti-aliasing, but how, how it works essentially is that you have one, for every one pixel on your screen, sort of beneath the surface, that one pixel is actually mapped onto an area bigger, sort of say three, three by three pixels. And let's say you're, you're, if, you're, if you're drawing a, a line across the screen like this, rather than having really very hard edges and sort of jaggy edges, uh, as you can see, uh, see in the example here, these are just sort of solid pixels. It will, it will map the, those pixels to a much larger area and then calculate based on, let's say, uh, one pixel up in the corner that uh, if, if we theoretically draw a line across it, only 25% of that one pixel in the corner is actually covered by this theoretical line and it will perform some calculations to determine the relative value of one pixel if it was in fact uh, taking up a much more space on a grid of, of say three by three or two by two or four by four pixels. The benefit to this is that it gives you the impression 
that your screen has much better resolution than it really does, and it increases readability significantly, so that you can use a, a very low-cost LCD, like a, just a generic 320 by 240 LCD, but you can, you can use the anti-aliasing to, to get a much higher quality image than, than you would otherwise be able to without investing months uh, into it yourself. You can see a, a magnified example here of, of text, for example, with no, no anti-aliasing, uh, with uh, two bit per pixel anti-aliasing and with four bit uh, per pixel anti-aliasing. And you can, you, this is fully configurable depending on the speed that you need and, and the, the color depth of your LCD. You can select the, the amount of, of, of anti-aliasing that is done. So uh, I'd mentioned this earlier. Uh, the library also includes a standalone UI development suite. Uh, it, there's a variety of tools included in it, but uh, called, this particular one is called GUI Builder. Again, I had already mentioned this, but the advantage is that this you can use a tool like this to separate or to help separate the UI design between the developers who are responsible for the firmware and the, maybe the, the people doing the UI design or uh, whether that's marketing or, or whoever. I think this, this, uh, tools like this can help speed up the, the prototyping and the development process compared to, let's say, I know I need this button here and this image over here and this Dropbox over here. And so without a tool like this, I sit down and I write my code and I set my manual pixels that draw a box, bracket zero, comma 27, na na na. I build that, I flash the chip, I run it, I go through my seven menus to get to the one menu that I want, and then I see, oh crap, it's, it's, it's two pixels off or it's one pixel too low. So I have to go through that whole process again. And you spend your whole day just to get a couple buttons positioned where you want. Uh, in, in code, it's easy to get what you want in Photoshop, but when you need to translate that into a, a, a real piece of, a, of compilable code, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a massive drain on time and, and resources. So having a, a tool like this definitely not only allows designers to maybe uh, be a bit more involved in the process, but even purely for the engineers doing the firmware, you can just quickly drag and drop some buttons to at least get a starting point. You're going to need to customize that anyway, but at least you can drag and drop all of your, your different controls onto the form. This doesn't create some custom binary file. It creates a real C file that you can open up in a text editor, insert some code yourself, modify it, play around with it, and you can just drop your file directly into Kyle or IAR, LPC Expresso, or GCC on a command line, whatever you want. It, it, it creates co code directly that uh, any developer can understand. Also, you can, uh, you, 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 can, you can make some changes by hand and open the C files back up in the editor. And it, I think it just makes both the collaboration and also just the development process uh, a bit more efficient. So as you can see, uh, a few lines of code just to, to, to get up and, uh, up and running with that dialogue that you made. The library also, I think quite importantly, something that really distinguishes MWIN from many other solutions is that it's easy to, to add uncompressed bitmap support to, to your graphics library. I've done it, it's about 50 lines of code, it's well documented, well understood. But when you want to start adding run length encoded compressed images, the demands get a bit higher. If you want to deal with uh, ping, uh, JPEG, GIF, that's a lot more demanding in terms of time and effort, and not just the, the development time to understand the compression algorithms and support all of the different ones that are, that are implemented, but also just the memory constraints. If you want to load a, a big uh, JPEG image, you need a decent chunk of, of memory to, to be able to do all of that, and Sager does a very good job of optimizing that for very resource constrained devices that you can load just little chunks of the image at a time and stream them out to the LCD. So you don't need three gigabytes, or three, uh, three megabytes of, of, of SDRAM to load a big JPEG. You can load little chunks of it at a time and stream that out. And again, that's why I think it's important to, to, to emphasize that there, there are many solutions out there for loading JPEGs, but there is almost nothing out there that is tailored for the specific needs of embedded developers. And Things like this where Sager has done all the hard work to, to make that efficient and, and scalable uh, to, to very small systems can be a huge time saver. Also, it, you, you, you can preserve things like the alpha channel in, in pings 
and, and, uh, and GIF images, which can, can, can just be a huge time saver if you want to render some high quality icons. So just the, the one last slide and uh, um, just a very rich text support as well. Maybe this, is a, this, this might not be a, a huge issue uh, if you only need to deal with an English speaking audience, but if you need to make a product that has to work in Thailand, in Japan, in, in Russia, uh, you need to deal with, uh, with these kind of language issues and uh, M1 also includes full Unicode support so that you can, you can display complex characters including left to right, right to left, so you can support Arabic, you can support Hebrew, you can support Thai, very complex scripts using 16-bit uh, Unicode which is a huge time saver because if you need to implement, implement that yourself, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's awful. I don't no, I don't believe it supports the full 32-bit uh, Unicode for, for Chinese characters. It's, it's limited to 16-bit at the moment, but that's already a, a huge plus if you need to, to deal with internationalization of your, of your applications. It just makes it far less uh, painful to, to integrate that. You can use it with any, any, you can currently use the library with absolutely any NXP ARM chip that we currently make free of charge no licensing fees, um, though it is intended to be used with specifically with chips with the LCD controllers where you're going to get the full functionality, which includes, we've got ARM7s, Cortex-M3s, Cortex-M4s. You can see sort of four of the most popular ones here uh, that, that most of the support from us will be coming from just providing board support packages. So uh, thanks for your time.